All right, thank you, everyone. Richard, you say? Okay, so good evening. Um, we got a good crowd here, and I'm, uh, there's no introduction, you know, uh, uh, without fanfare, we're just gonna start. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, as you know, this is a scientific lecture. It's really an education for science. Um, we are renting this space from the JCC. Uh, we're very uh, grateful for them that they're able to rent this in a timely manner. Um, but they have nothing to do with any of the content that's expressed here and the views that are expressed here. Uh, we're merely renting the facility for them. Is that clear? Yes. And the goal today is to really have a, a, a discourse and really talk about science which is something I think all of us yearn for at a time where everything in the world appears to become divided into you know, one camp or another camp, as we've talked about on every issue, be it climate change, be it... Sorry, Dr. Shane. Yes. We're, we want to film you with a professional camera and, be, and record us that way you have this. Sure. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, we can start again, yeah. Who's this? Who's recording for you? Yes, it's my partner. So this is great. We're two percent on your side. We just want you to be able to have Okay. It's right here. Okay. We're live streaming, by the way. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're, we're going to be. Can I start? All right. So, so, so part of um, what we want to do is we really want to talk about science today, talk about uh, science education, and really put it in the context of what I call the modern science of the immune system. So, I hope this will be helpful. It'll be about an hour, um, so if you can uh, keep your questions to the end, it would be uh, much appreciated. Um, as some of you know, know, I grew up in New Jersey here. I grew up uh, in Livingston, and then in Clifton, and in Patterson, and in Persephone, and so it's really nice to be back here. And uh, one of the important things I learned in, in Livingston in particular, there's a great teacher by the name of Jerry Walker. Um, he's he, he's uh, retired now, but he used to be the vice principal but he was an amazing chemistry teacher, um, but he was, a, he was a hard ass. If you, uh, I don't, how many people remember significant figures? Remember in chemistry, so if you had 99.991, and if you got one significant figure off, he would take 20 points off. Um, so it was very hard to get an A. Um, uh, so, so Jerry really uh, inspired me. He was not only a teacher, but he was also a, a carpenter and a general contractor. He put two kids through medical school. So this was in the 70s when, at a time in education, uh, I think it was a, in many ways a renaissance of American high school education. Teachers really care, um, and I'm st sure they do today, but it was a very special time. So I'm very fortunate to come back here to New Jersey. I learned a lot here. So uh, the immune system is a fascinating system. It's, it's evolved over billions of years from invertebrates to where we are. It's a very complex system. And our goal here is for me to traverse you through my journey to the immune system, which sort of integrates uh, to my journey through various aspects of health. Many people start asking, well, how did you get involved in some of the recent issues? It's, but I've always been involved in it, and that's what I want to walk you through today. Um, but it's gonna be, this is going to be like a, a class, okay? Uh, hopefully it won't be too pedantic, but we're going to start with a little bit of background. We're going to go through the research motivation. By the way, this lecture that I'm giving you here was a, almost a ditto lecture I gave to the National Science Foundation nearly two months ago. The National Science Foundation is one of the top uh, U.S. research uh, uh, agencies, and they have about seven to eight research centers all over the United States. They fund about $100 million to $250 million. Each center is dedicated to different aspects of research, and so this lecture was given at the NSF Center in Purdue for information theory. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of the research motivation. You're going to learn systems biology today. I'll walk you through my work in a technology I created called Cytosol, which actually helps us understand molecular mechanisms. And then we're, you're also going to learn this concept of systems architectures. You've probably seen the word architecture, like architecture of a building. But architecture also refers to other things. It refers to architecture of software. It refers to architecture of your body. Um, and this is a very interesting discipline because in the biological sciences, uh, uh, it's always people not actually doing architecture, it's people uh, working on building rooms in a house, if you want to think about it. For that matter, uh, a toilet in a house, right? They focus on very small pieces. The notion of architecture is actually relatively new to biology. And then we're going to talk about the immune system in the context of that as a modern architecture. And then I'm going to 
uh, leave open certain research questions. I know there's some young, young people here who are interested in science, but there's some very fascinating research questions that are open. Science, as we've talked about, is not settled. It's always open to new inquiry. Um, I may have to click this a couple times to get this going, but let's start with the background. So, as I mentioned to you, my personal background, some of you may know about this, but some of you may not, but I grew up in two worlds in India. I grew up in, in a very complex uh, city called Bombay, which was like an industrial furnace. You had every caste, every religion, um, uh, uh, every different type of language. You know, probably about 100 plus languages. If you think about New York City, across the river, Bombay was at by a factor of 100, okay? So I grew up in that, but I also grew up in this environment, which was a small Indian village in India. These are what the scenes of the village are, very different. Uh, about three months of the year was, you know, without electricity, without water, and these are those kind of scenes that you see there. So two vastly different worlds within India. But in this village, what was interesting is that my grandmother was a traditional farmer. You have to understand, India has a caste system, uh, which you know, some of you may know about. You won't, frankly, find a lot of Indians like me here. It's quite fortunate that my parents actually came here. We were considered untouchables in a caste system in India, uh, which was based on this deep hierarchy. So the fact my both my parents got educated, we came to the United States, and my parents ended up uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to go to a very good public school system in my high school here in Livingston is quite uh, fortunate. But uh, my grandmother was a farmer. She worked 16 hours a day in the fields. Um, subsistence farmer, it's not like they had thousands of acres, maybe like five acres, okay? Um, but on the weekends, that's a picture of her on her Sunday best, but on the weekends, she was a village healer. Now you have to understand, India has had systems of medicine that date back five, 10,000 years. One of the systems of medicine you may know about is called Ayurveda, uh, but there's actually something even older than that, and some people argue this called Siddha. Siddha was a system of medicine which included multiple branches, it included martial arts, it included, um, you know, marma, which was a predecessor to acupuncture, where they used pressure points on the body. It included herbal medicine. It included also the use of heavy metals, micro, what you would call nano uh, micro doses of heavy metals. So they had, uh, uh, or what you would call today like homeopathy equivalents, right? So they had the ability to uh, modulate, for example, cardiovascular disease with low doses of arsenic, um, low doses of the mercury. Um, so, and then yoga, yoga and what you call spiritual training. So there were five branches, Ayurveda uh, perhaps has two of them. So my grandmother would practice that system of medicine. Part of that system of medicine was observing, the, so in that system of medicine, the healer, by the way, in every village there was always typically a woman who was a healer. So in, in my village, my grandmother, uh, you know, 30, 40 people would line up on the weekends. She would observe their face. It's a technique called Samudrika Lakshana. And there's various diagnosis techniques. That's the art of medicine. So medicine ultimately is an art, and it, but it's also an information science. So in this uh, aspect of medicine, they had different ways of diagnosis. You could look at urine, you could look at people's eyes, you could look at the entire face, um, feces, etc. So she was an expert looking at the face, and based on looking at the face, she could understand different imbalances. Um, and then based on that, she would figure out for that individual the right medicine, you know, at the right time, where they were in the etiology of that disease for the right person, okay? Um, but, by the way, all these sophisticated words they didn't call it, this is me sort of making it perhaps more sophisticated than how they actually viewed it, even though it was quite sophisticated. So, um, once someone's, you know, uh, analysis was done, this is a little bit tricky here, um, can you go to the next slide? Um, so there is a whole system of Indian medicine. Now, you see these words here? Some, you don't have to worry about the words, but in the Western world, we use the words of what? Genes, proteins, right? Uh, molecular uh, processes, right? Disease, organs. Well, in this system of medicine, they had the concept that was called purusha, which was a non-existence, which means everything that existed before anything existed, which gave rise to everything manifest, which was called prakriti which is everything you see. And this gave rise to different subtle energy forms, which were called sattva, rajas, and tamas, which are very uh, unseeable energies, which then gave rise to what you actually see, the visible things in, in the world, space, air, fire, water, earth. And this was called pancha buddhas, which means five um, elements. And then these gave rise to what we'll call tridoshas. And the tridoshas were vata, pitta, kapha, 
and these comprise your tissues, that's what dhatus meant, and this comprise your body, which included not only your mind, but your senses, but also in the Indian system, the things called chakras, energy centers. But one of the key things was, when you looked at someone's body, as my grandmother would do, she would try to characterize them, were they vata, were they pitta, were they kapha. This was a person's co composition of these elements. Okay, so all, by the way, you don't need to learn all this. The point is, there's a whole other system of medicine, they didn't use the words called genes and proteins and DNA, okay? And they were able to, and I saw my grandmother use this system, observe people, Pe uh, you know, help people and empirically heal them. So I was fascinated as a child how this occurred. Um, but anyway, you could you could take a whole you could study a lifetime on uh, on Arve. The next slide. Um, so by the way, my parents came here in 1970. Next, and there we go. I can stay here. So one of the things was I was deeply interested in medicine when I came here as a seven-year-old kid. Worked uh, very hard. By the time I was 14. Um, I finished uh, calculus at Livingston High School, ninth grade, and the high school had no other courses to offer me. So I ended up, this little paper clipping came, by the way, today's eve of my mom's passing, about eight years ago, but it, you can see it says, Mina, uh, Shiva may like, like this. there's something, I think the note says, Shiva may be interested in this, from Marty. Marty Foreman uh, was my mom's uh, workmate at, at where she, when she worked at Rutgers. And this was about a teacher uh, Henry Mullish, who just passed away, I went to his memorial in Israel, um, and I gave uh, his second year memorial lecture. Um, I spent about seven days there, but Henry Mullish had decided that in the 1970s it would be really valuable to have educated software engineers. This is in 1978, when a computer would fill this entire room, and Henry decided that he was going to select 40 students who would get the opportunity, high school students, who would get the opportunity to go to the Corrin Institute of Mathematical Sciences to study computer science. And uh, I was one of those fortunate students who got accepted into this program. And my mom would drop me off at, um, everyone remember the PATH station here in Newark? Next slide. I don't know if it's, um, and I would take the train, where was that? From Newark, all the way up to Hoboken, up to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to NYU. That was, imagine a 14 year old kid taking the train at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. into their Many parents are afraid to send their kids down the street these days. But that's what I did as a kid. Is this working at all? Or, oh, there we go. Now it's working. I think I have to press it and hold it. Go back. Go back, please. Yeah. So um, NYU was a very special place. You know, this was a Corrin Institute. I studied with people, you know, 20, 30, 40 years older than me. But, I, but we learned seven different programming languages. This is in 1978. And then when I finished, um, I started working full time at, uh, this was as a 14 year old kid, the, the, the school system changed the rules so I could actually go work as a full time research fellow at University of Medicine Dentistry. I think it's called Rutgers Medical School now. Um, and this was what Newark looked like in those days. And uh, the opportunity that I was initially given was the opportunity to study, next slide, um, SIDS. Okay? SIDS. Um, is sudden infant death syndrome, everyone heard of it? Yes. And so this is in 1978. Um, Newark had some of the best data on watching sleep patterns of babies who died in their sleep. It's called an apnea, right? The baby stops breathing. So the idea was, could you watch the sleep pattern of the baby? I think what I'm gonna do, if I just go like this, you can just change it, it'll be easier for me. So babies have sleep patterns. Adults actually have uh, five states of sleep. Babies actually have six. They have an additional state of sleep. So the idea was, could you watch those stages of sleep patterns, next slide, and could you predict the onset of an apnea? So that's what I was doing, what you would today call AI. And I, and I actually ended up writing a paper on that um, several years later. But while I was there, um, and I want to address this because um, it, it really comes down to the notion of where does innovation take place. But while I was in Newark at Rutgers Medical School, I was given the opportunity to do something even more interesting. Um, in those days, how many people remember the inner office mail system? And you remember this? Well, in those days, in a, in a medical school, the way that organizations communicated was not through cell phones, there wasn't social media, there wasn't um, the internet per se, but there was the physical landline phone and this thing called the inner office mail system. And it was typically every secretary had one of these systems. Next slide. And on their desktop was inbox, outbox, folders, typewriter, you would write this thing called a memo to, from, subject, 
CC, you would attach a paper clip. So if you were going to hire someone, you'd write this cover letter, you would attach someone's resume to it, and then, what's that? Um, someone would uh, put it in their uh, uh, drafts folder, someone would edit it, right? It was a very complex system. Next. And then you would put it into one of these, this is what the memo looked like, by the way. You had attachments you could add, next. And then you would put it into this thing called the inner office mail envelope, next. And then you would send it out through these pneumatic tubes. Do you remember these? How many people remember these? Okay, so anyone over the age of 40 will, okay? Next. Um, and this was the inner office mail system, okay? This was before the ethernet, before what you have, next. So I was asked to convert that entire system in Newark, New Jersey, as a 14-year-old kid to the electronic form. Okay? We're not talking about simply exchanging simple text messages. All right? Which you could do little, like, messages. And by the way, in 1977, the RAND report, uh, a guy by the name of David Crocker, who was seen as the eminent guy in the field, had written that it was impossible to create a system like this. That, why? Because most of the people used computers in those days were typically men, in white lab coats, PhDs. And computer coding is a very complex thing. So they thought it, it was impossible to ever, first of all, take the secretary from the typewriter to the keyboard, that they were frankly not, quote unquote, qualified. That's why it says, impossible to build a system which would meet all users' needs. Next, next slide. But I didn't think so. I was sort of naive. And I wrote 50,000 lines of code to capture all of those features. And I call that system email. OK, that's the code of the Smithsonian. And uh, the reason I called it email was the operating system only allowed five characters, okay? It wasn't an obvious term in 1978 in Newark, New Jersey, for that matter, anywhere, because no one ever used that term before. Wrote the code, uh, called it email, next. And uh, this is Livingston Student, designs electronic mail system. All the, Stella Alexiak just passed away. Dr. Michelson in the back is still alive. He's still the head of high performance computing at Rutgers Medical School. He still does a lot of innovative biomedical research. But next, and uh, this was the one, one of the Westinghouse Science Awards. Next, and this was in the, the, the Rector's Magazine. And if you notice, this was also at a time when people were interested in prevention, okay, of healthcare. Next. Anyway, I give you that story for two reasons. That, first of all, the invention of email did not occur by the military. This is a false notion. It actually occurred in a health sciences institution where we were trying, where we were, it was a civilian application trying to move women from the typewriter to the keyboard. All right, called an email, wrote the code, next. And when I came to MIT, on the front page of MIT, if you zoom in, next slide, um, it talked about three students of interesting people who came in 1981, and one of them was this kid who invented the first, or invented this electronic mail system, next. Um, it gets even more interesting because when, when I met with the president of MIT, uh, he said, Shiva, it's too bad that you can't patent software. And the reason I'm telling you this is this is in 1981 uh, where people didn't even know what software was. They thought it was people writing novels or writing, uh, you know, a movie script. The legislators in Washington thought that software was a movie script. And in, in 1980, they had updated the copyright laws calling it the Computer Act of 1980, where you could protect software with copyright. So Dr. Gray, who also, by the way, came from Livingston, his mother lived here, who was the president of MIT, he was Reagan science advisor, said, Shiva, you should copyright it. So as a 18-year-old kid, I filled out this application, and I was awarded the first US copyright for email in 1982, officially recognizing as the invented email. So I called it email, wrote the code, and the reason I share this with you is because in the in the history of science, or the history of invention, um, the origin of things is important. Credit is important because it talks about where innovation comes from. The fact is that the in invention of email came from Newark, New Jersey. It didn't come from MIT, it didn't come from Silicon Valley. But more importantly, next slide, what I actually learned, which I, which I want to talk about, is really what is a system. You see, email is not simple exchange of messages, it's this entire system. Inbox, outbox, folders, right? CC, DCC, all of those features. So that's what we want to talk about. If we look at the world from a reductionist model, which is, oh, it's simple text messaging, it's easy to confuse people. But email is actually a system, all right? 
It is not simply sending messages from point A to point B. That was invented by Samuel Morse, okay? The, the, the exchange of text messages. So all of this was not to just re-clarify who invented email, but more importantly to talk about the fact that we're gonna talk about systems. Next. So next, so what's the research motivation here? Next. Um, so when you talk about systems, when I came to MIT, I was very, very interested in medicine because I really still, as a kid, wanted to understand how my grandmother, with no degrees, was able to look at the body, come up with diagnosis, come up with solutions, though she had no degrees. So I was very interested in medicine. So when I came to MIT, I found out that a very advanced technology school, science and technology school at MIT, treated the body as parts. Okay, so if you look at this picture, you have a bunch of parts um, connected to each other, right? You don't really have the notion of, next slide, um, the whole. And what this has led to in medicine is that, so there's a, there's a, the reality of how we treat the body. So if you go to a doctor with some issue, let's say you have a headache. Well, the medical healthcare system triages you to multiple people. You may get sent to it, someone who does endocrinology, right? Someone who does neurology. Someone maybe thinks it's a, a psychosomatic issue, right? To a psychologist. You get triaged to multiple people. In fact, the healthcare model right now incentivizes people when you walk in to try to find as much problems as they can and triage you to multiple people. So you split the body up into multiple systems. Everything okay, Richard? Um, next. So, and what that has led to is because we want to really talk about, uh, uh, everyone talks about pharma, right? How does a pharma industry work? It too treats the development of a drug in a very linear fashion, in a very um, reductionist model, okay? So in that model, they're trying to find a drug, okay? And then what is a drug? Well, a drug, so just to be clear, um, uh, if you eat a piece of mint, right, or if you eat uh, curry powder, right, if you add an apple today, right, that's not a drug, right? In fact, curry powder has probably a million chemicals in it, or 10,000 chemicals in it, I don't know the number. It's many, many individual compounds. Food is actually a combination of many different natural compounds. A drug is something, first of all, it's a compound, a chemical structure that does not occur in nature. Okay? It's a compound that synthesizes. It's a synthetic compound that heretofore typically did not exist in nature. And uh, in the United States, for, for that matter in the world, we have around 30,000 of these compounds that people have in what are called libraries. And so the way drug development works today, uh, everyone knows New Jersey is a center, one of the biggest centers of drug development, is what they do is they start with the process of, first of all, someone will make a compound in a lab, you know, like one of the universities, and they'll do what's called in vitro screening. What in vitro screening means is they'll take that compound and they'll drop it into a test tube. In vitro means into a test tube. Inside that test tube may be cells, like cancer cells, right? Uh, or maybe cells with some type of dysfunction, and they'll see, well, what is that doing? And they'll say, oh, we have a hit. This compound has some effect on that cancer cell. It looks like it's killing cancer cells. If it doesn't, they'll try another compound. And, and another one, another one, another one. Today, that's called high throughput screening. If they find a hit, at this point, they go raise a ton of money, 30, 40, 50 million dollars from a venture capitalist, and then they'll do what's called in vivo, which means they, they get animals and they'll, they say, well, this worked in the test tube. We gotta see what it does actually in an animal. They don't do it on a human yet, but they do it in rat or pig or mice at this point. And if they see the same effect here, in this model, then right before they get here, so they've gone down to these one, two, three steps, at this point here, they have to go to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, they say, we want to test this compound now on human beings. All right? In order to test it on human beings, the FDA says, well, show me toxicology data that it's not going to kill a mammal, right? In this case, a rabbit or pig. So they have to prove that to them. They have to also, they have to prove two things. Does that compound have efficacy? Which means, does it work? Does it actually do what it says? And does it not kill people? Which is toxicity. All right? So efficacy and toxicity. So if it gets approved, this part is called an investigational new drug, IND filing. So you file for an IND, 
and then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then thousands of pieces of paper you have to submit. And then, after, if that's approved, then you get to do phase one, phase two, phase three, okay? This means you start small groups of humans, larger groups, and much larger groups. And by the way, if you're a drug company, um, only 20% of the drugs are making it past phase one. If they make it past phase one, your stock price goes really way up, and phase two goes even higher up. Phase three, you have a winner, and then everyone um, you know, is happy. If you look at this, it takes one to five billion dollars to do this process end to end. It's about 13 years, and um, only 20% make, make it out of here. And first of all, this system is not personalized for the individual. It's for a single drug, single compound, so it's not even multiple combinations. So they can't really, you can't go to a drug company and say, T tell me how curry powder works, or tell me how an apple works, okay? Because these are multiple compounds. And it's not personalized, and there's no precision, okay? And it's nearly impossible to use this methodology to understand combinations. Is this clear? So what I'm showing you here, this is how the drug development process works. Now notice I said it takes 13 years, so there's some very interesting economics here. You remember I told you that I couldn't patent software in 1978? Uh, By the way, you can patent software in 1994. Um, but you can patent a drug. Uh, anyone know how long the life of a patent is? 20 years, okay? So by the, if it takes you 13 years to create the drug, how many years do you have left to monetize on it? You have seven years, okay? So if this truck took, if, I'm sorry, if this drug took, let's say, a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars to do, and you only have a hundred thousand people who can use it, right? That means you want to, you have to price it sufficiently high to make your investment back in those seven years. So that gives you, so once you understand this, you get sort of the whole picture, right? Very long development process, and um, so, so, by the way, pharma companies are recognizing this. And pharma companies themselves want to move to personalized medicine. They want to move to precision medicine. They want to go here, but, but it's difficult to go here. Next slide. Uh, by the way, the way that pharma drugs get developed, from a, by the way, it's a, it's a very linear model, so I'm going to put on my engineer's hat, um, is the way that we used to do airplane development about 100 years ago. So you came up with a design. This would be like the compound equivalent. You put a pilot and you went right to human, and if he failed, you said, oh, geez, he, he died, okay? <laughs> and you went back to your next design. And you did this process, and then if it, if it succeeded, then after the fact, you try to explain why this wing structure worked, why Bernoulli's e equation worked, okay? So it's basically shoot out there, what happens, something works, something doesn't, and fundamentally, this is how drug development still is today. Next. Um, and this is the actual, by the way, this, even though it's 2006, this hasn't changed much. So what you see here is drug companies spend year over year over year spending on R&D. Okay, that means every year they're spending 30% more. They're plowing money into R&D because they're not actually finding enough new drugs, by the way. That's why people are moving to things called cell therapies. So, but the reality is they're getting less and less new drug approvals, okay? So pharma knows that their model is failing, which is this linear model. Next. And this is another way of looking at it also. So here you see the rising R&D costs and they're finding less and uh, less drugs that are actually making it through the approval process because of toxicity. Next. And this is another way of looking at it. Basically their return on investment is going down in terms of the old way of doing drug development. Next. And the effects that this is happening is quite extraordinary because if you look at the, on the health side, these are sort of the ratios um, of the fact that uh, what percentage of the U.S. public is basically uh, obese, okay? And you can see it's quite extraordinary. 32% of Americans uh, over 20 years old are obese. You can see the number in the different age groups. So we have an interesting problem. The pharma model is failing, meaning, and they know it. You have this increasing model of the number of people who are actually unhealthy in the United States, what is it, about 30%, right? Of obesity now and growing. And, and childhood obesity is also increasing. Next. And when you look at this, you see also these two groups of adults is about approaching 40%, youth are about 18% obesity. Okay, did you guys know this? So it's quite extraordinary. This is the actual condition, you know, and where, we're, where we are, and this has probably grown since then. Next. And 
separate from this, when you start looking at expen expenditure, something very interesting is going on. The amount of healthcare, all of this is leading to we're spending about 20% of our GDP on healthcare, okay? Uh, which means close to, uh, if your GDP is around uh, 20 trillion, so we're spending about 4 trillion, 3.7 trillion on healthcare. And it's much higher than the defense budget. And it's because of two things. The develop the pharmaceutical development model is not working, and the fact that we're not we don't we haven't really understood how to take care of our health from a systemic standpoint. Next. So why is this occurring? So my view is everyone heard the story of the blind man? Okay, so there's a very famous story, the enlightened Buddha tells a story of the of a king who invites six blind men to, and he brings in an elephant. And the elephant Consider this represents some disease, okay? Could be some disease, lupus, it could be cancer, it could be any disease. And the, so in this case, a blind man touch different parts of the elephant and they each see something very different. So the person who touches a tail thinks it's a brush, the person who bumps into the leg thinks he's bumped into an oak tree, the person who touches a tusk thinks it's a spear and so on. You get the idea, right? Each one of them has a blinded view of this reality. Next. And if they were ever able to work together with this blind view, you'd, you'd end up something like this, okay? Which looks nothing like the elephant. Next. And the reason this is taking place, in my view, is the entire basis of academic science is based on, like, the blind man. In the biological sciences, um, you can win a Nobel Prize for understanding how two proteins interact. You can win a Nobel Prize for understanding a part of the problem. You don't win a Nobel Prize for solving the whole thing as of today. So it's very specialized. There's lack of communications. People don't talk to each other. There's no integration of data. And fundamentally, it's non-holistic. OK? So next. So what's happened is, so a very big question is that a research question that I want to throw is, are we doing research, discovery, and innovation correctly? Meaning, right now, we're, we, it's very exclusive, you know, a small set of people. Uh, work together. It's very, very opaque. It's reductionist, right? You study the parts. It's highly centralized. It's censored because most of the research is peer-reviewed. It's supposed to be a good thing, but Einstein did not publish one paper peer-reviewed. I don't know if you know that. His last paper he submitted to Physical Review, uh, he said, they said, we want to send it out for peer review. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, how can peers review anything innovative? He goes, innovation should always be put out there and let it handle the public, um, you know, attacks and debate and discourse. Um, and it's depersonalized, okay? Next, which means everything's viewed as one big statistical blow. Now, the alternative way is the research question is, can we be inclusive, transparent, a systems-based approach, decentralized freedom, which means open science, and where you take into account that individual chemistry is very, that there needs to be a personalization. Next. So that's where systems biology comes in. And that's what's fascinating. Everything I've shared with you is where science was headed, but something significantly changed in 2003. Hey, Richard, can I have some water? Oh, great, thanks. Um, so something significantly changed um, in the world when systems biology came. Next. And you may have seen me sh share this before, but let me walk you through this. So what happened in 1993, right around here, is when we started doing, you guys can hear me still? Yeah. So when we started, when the Human Genome Project started, the goal was, could we map out the human genome? And when the Genome Project started, you see around 1990, what does that number say, 100,000? So we thought that what made a human being different than a, a small worm was a number of genes. We knew a worm in 1990 had around 20,000 genes. So we thought, wow, we're at least five times more complex. We must have at least 100,000 genes. What do you see happens? So they're not finding that many genes. Year, every year is going by. The Genome Project is not finding enough genes. You come down to 2004, how many genes do we find? 20,000 genes. OK? So we have the same number of genes as a worm. So the problem is biologists are very reductionist. They do not look at the body as an engineering system. They thought, oh, more parts, more complexity. You follow what I'm saying? But it's not the number of parts that mean complexity. It's how the parts are connected. 
So even though I give you 20,000 parts, those 20,000 in the human being may be connected in very much more complex interconnections. No different than if I gave everyone here 10 beads, 10 marbles, and some string. One person could just connect them in a very linear way. Some of, some of you may make very different complex patterns. So it's the interconnections that make the difference. So biology underwent a revolution in 2003. Next. And that revolution was to recognize that if we want to know, know the whole body, by the way, this is a slide from Peter Hunter, who was working on the human physiome project between New Zealand and um, Auckland and, and Oxford. And what, what Peter proposed was this concept of systems biology, which said, here's the genes, but we're not just genes. Genes give rise to proteins. Protein gives uh, interact in, you know, in cellular functions. In you know tissues and organs, etc. So we need to go across all these different scales to understand the whole. Very much like what traditional systems of medicine was trying to do, trying to understand the whole. And we have to go across many different types of systems over many, many different length scales. Next. So this gave rise to this field called systems biology. Okay. And one of the big things that came out was um, in 2003, the National Science Foundation said. Could you mathematically understand all these connections? Next slide. Which means if you view this human cell, forget about the nucleus, because we know we're not just genes. We're all the interconnections that take place, all the different molecular reactions. So if we could understand those molecular reactions, and if we could do it, let's say, on the computer, we could save ourselves a lot of time and money, right? We're not just shooting out in the dark. We're actually using some computing. So the goal was, could you mathematically model the whole cell? Next. And so if you think about all these little, if you think about there's all these chemical reactions taking place in your body right now, trillions of chemical reactions. And you can win a Nobel Prize just for figuring out how this reacts with that. Do you know that? So, but imagine putting all of this together. That was seen as an impossible problem. So in 2003, I went back to MIT because my advisor said, Shiva, you've always loved computing. You've always loved medicine. And I, I had gone in and out of MIT, done a bunch of degrees. Um, I was very interested, always in computing and medicine, going back to my grandmother. And Forbes Dewey, my advisor, told me to come back. And I came back. And the idea was, could you create a new technology to facilitate the integration of molecular pathways? So what goes on in research today, imagine everyone at this table today running a scientific center, okay? Which means each one of you may have thousands of people working for you. So over on this left aisle could be working, people working on cancer, maybe this left middle aisle working on Alzheimer's. Over there, people are working on ALS, right? Uh, and in the middle aisle over there, people working on some cancer. All of you guys are specialists, and every chair is working on a little part of that, okay? And what are you doing? What each one of you, is today incentivized to get grant money and write papers. So every one of these chemical reactions, there's probably, if you go to PubMed, some, chemical, some paper written on there. So if you type in, I don't know, uh, osteoarthritis, if you do it right now on PubMed, there's around 22,000 papers written, okay? And if you read those papers, you'll find out each one of those papers was produced by someone at one of these institutions. And within those papers is one of these little, next slide, um, is one of these little molecular pathways. Some guy said, well, you know, I did this research, you know, did these to some animals, and I found out A reacts with B, and B reacts with C, C reacts with D. Okay, this is called a molecular pathway. So basically, if I look out at this audience, and if, if you say everyone here is working on uh, the immune system, right? Every person here is publishing little pieces of these pathways. You follow me? So it's basically... Each, everyone here is trying to reverse engineer the human body and trying to understand these different pieces, what nature did. And those are being published. Right by the time we probably end this seminar, right, there'll probably be a bunch of papers published. Well, what was occurring in 2003 was we knew there were these ball and stick diagrams out there, and some of them were starting to become mathematical models. You don't have to worry about what this means. All it means is that these are different concentrations of these species. And people were writing mathematics to actually predict these chemical reactions. But they couldn't be, go back, previous slide, they couldn't be this big. Next slide, they were only small models, okay? So when I came back to MIT in 2003, the head of our department was maybe doing around 50 of these pathways. He wasn't able to get to something bigger, so people said, ah, this is too difficult of a problem. 
Next. So I took on this challenge. And by the way, to give you an idea, this is one of the pathways involved in cancer. Here are five molecules. They're all interacting together. This is like those Monday night football diagrams, right? Next. Um, so five molecules, six interactions. Next. And these were being converted to mathematical models where people would figure out the concentrations. It's basically chemistry, stoichiometry. Next. And then people would calculate, OK, if I started with this many chemicals, the concentration, I get this. So you can actually predict how chemicals interacted. All right, next. And so the idea was, if you have the genes, and these are proteins, how do you build, imagine modeling the entire human cell. Why is this valuable? Forget even the cell, if you could model Alzheimer's, if you could model different diseases, we could figure out how the combinations of food, proteins work, and could, we could develop, maybe find out how my grandmother did that thing, right? So I was really excited about this. But to go from here to here to here, uh, was seen as a nearly impossible problem. Next. So, so we're looking, by the way, we're looking at 20,000 proteins. Next. We have around, you know, 40,000 protein protein interactions. We've mapped out around next 60,000 proteins. Next. And there's a finite set of metabolic pathways. Next. And you have about five to 10 major models. So that was a state in 2003. Next. So the approach I took was I said, look, this is not a biology problem. <laughs> This is not a chemistry problem. I said, this is actually an engineering problem. So I said, everyone who's working on these pieces, so if this is a human cell, this blue circle, and let's say we're trying to model cancer. There could be many different pathways. If this represented the immune system, there are many different pieces. Well, every one of you, be reductionist. Be biologist. We're not going to change you overnight. Keep doing what you're doing, and I will create a technology that will let you be decentralized, Remember that word? Let you do your work. And I will create a technology that will interconnect all of these chemical reactions without you, without ever having to do it monolithically. Because if you try to do it together, it's too complex. But if you see it as parts, and so, next slide. So I built a whole technology which allowed you to do This was the basis of my PhD thesis in 2007. But for my PhD thesis, which, which I'll get to, in MIT, they don't let you graduate unless you do something really new. Uh, by the way, only 50% of people make it through the qualifying exams, and then they treat you really badly to try to get your graduates. So you have to do something significant. So if email, by the way, was the electronic version of the inner office communication system, Cytosol, which is what I call this, was the electronic version of the molecular communication system. It laid down a whole new operating system to do this. And by the way, when we did this, no one believed we could do this. You had to deal with all the stuff, and we had to publish papers, which I'll talk about. But fundamentally, we created a whole new revolutionary technology to actually molecularly understand things. Next. And by the way, here's a very complex pathway, OK? This was considered complex in 2003. People were using hand tools to mathematically model this. Next. So we took this and we split it. This complex system, we split it into four pieces. We had to prove that our system worked. So if this is a whole, we split it into four. Next. And then we solved it. So here's cytosol solution, and this is what was done manually. So we got the same answer, meaning that we had a technology that could take components, systems, and we would get the same answer. Next. Next. So this was published in a major journal, OK, in the Cellular and Biological Engineering Journal. Next. So what I'm trying to say is what we had actually created then was something that what got me excited was, wow, I could really understand how my grandmother mixed components together, how nature work or get a better handle on it because we can handle compound. See the S there? Big difference. Because we could handle multiple combinations and Cytosol could mine existing work from everyone. So we're not just taking pieces. That's what we, you would call cherry picking of data. We would take everyone. We don't care if you're from Harvard or you're from a small institution because what goes on in science is um, there are people who can, you have the Harvard view of cancer or the Stanford view, right? And much of that can generate different income streams for perpetuating different fiefdoms. We said, we'll take every data, we'll mine it, and we will build complex models of all different disease functions. Next. And oh, go back, go back. Uh, and by the way, we would do this before you went to, before you went to the, uh, before you killed animals, OK? Let, next slide. And by the way, this is how we do um, airplanes, right? We don't just throw a pilot in and we say, gee, gee was he died. Everything that's built today is done on the computer. Okay? The problem is we rely on computers too much. That's what happened with the Boeing 737s. The pilots who are getting trained actually don't even know how to fly planes, except watch 
instruments. Uh, but this gets done first, and then you know, then you go do wind tunnel testing, etc. But this is a modern way of doing stuff. You understand systems. Okay? Next. So what we ended up creating with my technologies, we have this engine, we have a way that we can actually go through information. So I don't look at one person's view, that like the left view or the right view. I can look at holistically what's in science at a certain point, mine that data, simulate it, give it back to the scientific community, and this is the scientific method in the new way. Next. And by the way, what we're able to do is we can identify a problem, let's say lupus. We can extract all the literature. I know many of you are doing this, right? Some of you are interested, you're going and reading PubMed. Is that right? How many, how many of you guys are doing that, right? I know some of you are doing that. You go read PubMed and you're trying to understand something, but you have all these papers. Well, we figured out a way to do that in a much more high throughput fashion. We then integrate these models and then we actually build architectures and then we can actually model them long before we go um, kill any animals. Next. So, next. So, let me give you. Uh, so, we work with many people for previous. So, we have some of the innovative, previous slide, some of the innovative pharma companies come to us. We work with universities. We work with functional food companies. We have a lot of nutritional companies who actually want to make great products. And even the, some of the stuff at Whole Foods, if you take supplements, no one really knows if the stuff really works. People are just throwing stuff together. So the idea is, can you actually functionally understand how they work? Next. So people have started using us in many, many different ways. Next. So let me talk about systems architecture. Next. So what we're able to do is, we're able to take all the literature that's written, find from that literature all those little ball and stick diagrams. By the way, everyone following me? Am I going too fast? It's OK? OK. Um, from that literature, we're able to find these molecular pathways, interconnect the dots. And by the way, we're not saying this is perfect, right? Because we're only good at the stuff that's done out there. If we could do more of this, we'd get better of this. And then we mathematically model it, and then we're able to actually understand at the mechanistic level what's going on. Next. So I'll give you an example. Um, everyone know like Alzheimer's, ALS, um, right? Neurodegenerative diseases. So I was giving a talk similar to this, and one of the leading neuroscientists in the world said, Shiva, I want to work with you. And he was actually wanting to do a systems approach. So in the brain, so if you look at the brain, I'm going to give a simple example. You have the brain. Surrounding the brain is what's called the blood-brain barrier, which is basically made up of arteries. And if you were to stretch that arteries, it would go from San Francisco to Los Angeles in your own brain, okay? And it's made up of these arteries, which and an artery, that little, um, this little tan color is what's called the endothelial. So the surface of your, the arteries is made up of what's called a, a cell type called the endothelial. It's surrounded by this thing called the parasite, which is like a valve. So blood is flowing through here. Imagine the brain being uh, treated as the astrocyte. So you have what's called the neurovascular unit. The artery, which is the endothelial, the parasites in your brain denoted by the astrocytes. Okay? This is a lateral view of it. Well, there's a growing research saying that destruction of the parasites, okay, leads to pretty much every neurovascular disease. Well, the parasites were evolved, one theory is, over many, many millions of years to handle certain types of exogenous things. Well, we have a lot more other things in the atmosphere now, right, that we don't know about. So basically, holes in the parasites destroy the blood-brain barrier, and you get all these neurovascular diseases. So when we looked at this, next slide, we literally used cytosol and we looked at with, by the way, USC uh, 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 was a partner in this. Varislav Zilkovich is one of the leading guys in blood-brain barrier. So we just brought this whole new way of approaching it. So these are all the molecular pathways in the endothelium. Behind this are thousands of papers. You see what I'm saying? Next. And behind, and this is the parasites. That, that pink structure, and this communicates with the endothelial, next. And then you have this system communicating with this, okay? So you have three different systems, next. But the cool thing that I, I feel that I contributed a lot to this research was saying, okay, that's all interesting, but let's take an engineering systems approach, the ankle bones connected to the foot bone. So what we said here was, when you build a building, you have the foundation layer. Any civil engineers here, building contractors? Okay. When you build something, you start with the foundation, then what do you do? You build the plumbing and the electricity, and then you build the interior design, right? 
When you build a piece of software, you start with the data layer, then you build the communications layer, then you have the apps running on top of it. Well, biologists don't think like this, so we brought this thinking to them. The foundation layer is the actual anatomy. So here's the endothelium, here's the parasites, here's the astrocytes. Each one of these little boxes here are those molecular mechanisms, which could be every one in this, each one of you in your chairs doing research on this or this or this. Those are the specialties. And then we found the communications between these two structures. There's six communication block boxes between the endothelium and the parasites, two between this, and then we layered in all these diseases. And what do you see here? It's fascinating. Everyone thinks Alzheimer's and ALS are very different diseases. It turns out this disease and this disease have the same common dysfunction, the PDGF pathway. You don't need to, the main takeaway from this is Western medicine views everything, compartmentalizes everything into diseases. But when you go down the systems level, you actually see different diseases are actually breakdowns in communication in certain components. Everyone follow me? So a systems approach leads you to a very different set of conclusions than breaking it up and, okay, you gotta go see the ALS specialist, you gotta see the right? This lets you look at it from an engineer standpoint. Next. By the way, when we go back, when we submitted that uh, paper, half of the, by the nature of neuroscience is considered one of the most eminent journals in the world. So when we submitted that, um, half of the reviewers thought this was brilliant and the other half thought it was crazy because they never heard of these terms. Anyway, we had to write back a 20 page response next and it was published in Nature Neuroscience. It was a big victory because I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm an engineer. We went into a field and we made a significant contribution. So an engineer's approach is a very different approach than a biologist's approach. Next. Let me give you another example. You guys getting bored? No. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give you another approach, okay? This was a project done with four institutions and this was a problem we were looking at. Next. The problem we were looking at was when you exercise or when you run, here's your artery. Blood flows through the artery and guess what? A very important chemical gets released called nitric oxide. I think Time Magazine, one of those journals, said nitric oxide was a molecule of the century. This is how, this is the basis of biography, okay? You generate vasodilation. But when blood flows, NO gets released in the presence of arginine. Okay, by the way, there are certain foods that have arginine in it. So arginine is very good uh, catalyst for supporting vasodilation. The issue is how does this happen? Andrew Koo, one of the PhD guys in my lab at MIT, Andrew had meticulously set up an experiment where he could send blood flow, or flow, and he could measure NO release. So that's an experiment, a wet lab. Now, when you look at, see these little tiles, imagine this is your bathroom tiles, that's the endothelial. If you do a zoom in on it, you find that on the surface, is a Christmas tree-like structure called a glycocalyx. When blood flows over that, nitric oxide gets released, okay? And when NO gets released, there's a whole set of chemical processes. This is actually a Christmas tree which waves, okay? It moves. It's a mechano mechanical action results in chemical release. Next. And what you see here is that if you go read the literature about nitric oxide release, you'll see all the blind men, okay? This guy's saying, no, this is a chemical reaction. No, this is this, no, this is this, okay? Everyone's got their viewpoint. So what we were able to do next was using this approach, we were able to keep these as separate little fiefdoms but interconnect them. Next, and what you're gonna see here is quite impressive. This line, from a system's perspective, represents how much nitric oxide will get released over time. But behind that line is not some statistic, it's the actual mechanisms. Next. But no one would believe that this is the actual wet lab experiments. Quite impressive, right? So what we're saying is that our technology can actually model very complex functions and we can validate with in vitro work. Next, next. And this was published, by the way, next, in one of the most eminent journals in the world called Cells Biophysical Journal. The reason I'm sharing this with you is I had to do all this to be able to validate a systems approach to what I'm gonna share with you on the immune system. Next. So, by the way, um, how much, what time are we, Richard? Uh, 7.54. Okay, so we're good. So, um, let me give you, let, let's, go, let's go after this, keep going. Next slide, next, in the interest of time, next, 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 next. Okay, let me go over here. So, getting back to the drug world, okay? In the, so this paper came out about four or five years ago. 
This is, you know, in cancer therapy, they did what's called chemotherapy, right? They hit someone with a single drug, um, and different people get different drugs. This article in Nature was saying that the only way that you're gonna solve cancer is you have to use a curry powder approach or a cocktail approach. You have to hit people with multiple drugs. Now, why were they saying that? From putting their hat on, what happens is these drugs are very, very toxic, right? At certain levels. So if, if they, remember what I told you with the FDA, they give allowances for, for to, they wanna make sure that you don't kill somebody. That's what their goal supposedly should be, okay? But in their model, what they do is they test, does this drug have efficacy? Does it actually kill cancer cells? But is the dosage that you're giving it at, is it also gonna kill the person, okay? So you're always modulating, you wanna give this much of this drug, but it could hurt it. So this paper was saying, imagine giving this much of a drug, but not just one drug, a bunch of them, a cocktail. So you lower the dosage, but it has what's called a synergistic effect, which is sort of what food does, right? So that's what this paper was saying, and I don't know any of the authors of this paper, but, next slide, but my thesis was the only one cited in there as having the potential capability of doing this combination therapy. So when this paper came out, next, um, we decided why don't we do this? And in fact, to give you a fun example, if you go to India, and people like my grandmother see you, they would do combination therapy, right? Uh, everyone heard of curcumin? Okay, next slide. So, uh, it turns out Indians get one third less liver cancer than Asians because of the high consumption of turmeric, which is a yellow herb uh, in curry powder, and the active ingredient of that is called curcumin. So what we did was, we found out every paper written on curcumin, this is the outer cell wall, this is the nuclear wall. To keep it simple, all these little ball and stick diagrams represent all those molecular reactions across 7,000 papers that we've integrated, and we've looked at where curcumin interacts, and where cur curcumin blocks inflammation, okay? In all different places it does it. And then we mathematically modeled this. Next, we also looked at resveratrol. Resveratrol, which is a, the, the skin of grapes, also hits other areas, okay? Next, and then what we did was, we said what happens when you combine them together, next. And what we're able to do is, without killing animals, we can do in silico experiments. To keep it simple, if you look at this column, this column, this column, this third column is the amount of inflammation in your body. And we're simulating this on a computer. 0.5 means high inflammation, 0.03 means little. So in the first experiment, no curcumin, no resveratrol, you have high inflammation. Everyone see that? Then we give curcumin, just by no resveratrol, what do you see happens? It goes down. Then you just give resveratrol, it also goes down from 0.05 to 0.016. But look what happens when you lower the dosage of curcumin from five to three in dosage from resveratrol from five to two. This is called a combination, okay? And what do you see? This lowers it even more. So you're giving less of an ingredient, but it has what's called a synergistic effect. This is why people say food is medicine, right? Or, or why the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. What's that? But, but we're able to do this, before it was just like hand waving, right? So no one would believe sort of the holistic people. They'd say, well, you're just saying stuff, right? But we're actually able to do that here. Next. And by the way, in order for me to prove to the outside world, we took on an interesting challenge when that paper came out. We said, what would happen if we could do better than pharma? So what we did was we, the next slide, keep going. Next, next, next. Um, in cancer therapy, I don't know if you know how, they, how the, the pharma guys go after cancer. Do you know what their strategy is? They do a, a, a left hook and a right hook process, which is called apoptosis and cell proliferation. So in cancer, cells that are supposed to die do not die. Okay, so they want to cause cell death. The, a big word for that is called apoptosis. Okay, so you can impress people if you want with that word. But apoptosis means cell death. And so we literally modeled all the mechanisms of apoptosis for pancreatic cancer, next. And then we did the same. The other strategy, cells start proliferating that shouldn't. We modeled all those pathways, next. And then as an example, what we did was we went through every drug that was a generic drug, and we did combinations on the computer, not killing animals, and we actually found one combination that did better than what they were using and we applied for an IND. And we were only like a seven person group. The only reason I did this was to show that I could do stuff faster and cheaper and better than that. And guess what? When we had to actually, we said, you know what? We'll even go to the FDA, see if we'll, the discovery we had, we'll submit it to the FDA. And lo and behold, when we submitted it, 
uh, 60 days into it, we got a call from the FDA. They said, you know, we don't normally do outbound calls, but what you guys are, is so impressive is what we see happening in the 23rd century. And then anyway, we got this allowance. So we, we were actually able on the computer to find a combination that did better than the one that's out there. And then we didn't know what to do. We just spun it off with MD Anderson. My point is, this was really not my interest, but I wanted to show I could play with the big guys. Because my real interest was really doing, you know, understanding how my grandmother did stuff. So. Next. Um, anyway, next. So let's talk about how this technology can be used in very powerful ways. Um, so four years ago, um, uh, four, two, God, five years ago, uh, this article came out in the MIT Technology Review. You see what it says? This is a science magazine. I, I was featured on this, it was a very eminent science magazine. And I was walking down the street and I saw this and it looked like an ad for Monsanto. It says, buy fresh, buy GMO. And they were making joke of the buy fresh, buy local movement. Okay? And as you read this article, you see it says, population growth and climate change will make it harder to feed the world. We need to overcome the fears of genetically modified food. And so I was interested in this. I didn't know a lot about GMOs. So I started researching it. And uh, I heard from, started talking to a lot of people. I heard some farmers in, um, in the Midwest were saying that when they had GMO corn, they were finding high levels of formaldehyde. So there's a guy called Don Huber, he's a professor emeritus at Purdue. I said, Don, how could this be happening? He said, well, that could happen if one of the molecular mechanisms was offset when they did the genetic engineering. And no one, everyone was talking about glyphosate, which you've heard, Roundup, but no one actually had really done the systems level understanding what happens when you actually re-engineer the, the genome uh, of this. By the way, so we took soy, 97% of the soy in the United States is genetically engineered. Okay, only 3% is organic. And what I did was, you know, um, as a part of, I did this as a public service. I went back to Livingston High School um, and we found the top five best um, AP chemistry students. And we also included them in our research. You know, this was sort of public citizen science research. Next. So what we found, by the way, at that time, there's all these, you have articles like this saying how great GMO corn is. Next. Um, and you know that you know, and then th you know that there's danger to it. Next, uh, and that you know Monsanto is going to kill the world. So you have both sides. Next, so my question was, can we actually take a science approach? Can, it's, there's a pro and the anti. Can I take? Can I actually find out what's going on here? Next, so we wanted to find the middle ground. So what we did was we. Next slide, um, and we wanted to understand. What's in between non-GMO and GMO? Now, it turns out that the way that they decide what's GMO and non-GMO is based on a property called substantial equivalence. Is this thing look sort of like this? Everything okay, Richard? Yeah. Okay. If it is, it must be the same, okay? So it's called substantial equivalence. So remember that term. So there's a thesis that the FDA has called you, substantial equivalence, I'll come to it, next. So if you want to show that a GMO tomato is quote unquote safe to a non-GMO tomato, you basically have to show substantially equivalent, next. So how did they do that, next. Is in 1976, Gerald Ford signed into law um, a, a, a guideline called substantial equivalence. Why did he do this? In 1976, medical device companies, let's say someone made a stethoscope, all right, and it took them seven years to get that. This, uh, biomedical devices have to go through the FDA for allowance. It took seven or eight years to get allowed. Then suppose you, as the inventor, you make one little change. You just change the color from white to blue or something. Well, in the old, I'm giving you a, an extreme example. You'd have to go through another seven years of approval because you just made an itsy weeny teeny weeny change. So that was holding down American innovation. So Ford signed to this law. He said, if you can show that what you've created is substantially equivalent, you could fast track it. Next slide. And that was, uh, and that was written into law, into, uh, into this program called the 510K program. Next. Um, and if you read the law, it says a manufacturer should be clearly identified the technological characteristics of each device individually. So what this meant was you as a manufacturer say what criteria you want to measure. So when genetically engineered foods came on the market, 
how do you compare an itsy, because the makers of these genetic engineered foods were saying, all I'm doing is making an itsy weeny teeny weeny change. Um, so, it's, so they said we should use this ruling. So the manufacturers like a Monsanto would say, well, this soy plant is substantially equivalent based on criteria that they choose, the color, the weight, the amount of protein, the fat. We follow it's self-reported. So next slide. So what we wanted to find out was where the, are there actually characteristics that are substantially different, right? If you compared, so for example, we could say that males and females are substantially the same. But if you actually looked at the X and Y chromosome, you would find, for example, let's say a, a substantial difference, right? Um, it's what you look at to compare it. Next. So what we did was soy, as I mentioned, is 97% uh, genetically engineered. Next. Uh, so we went through every paper written on soy, okay? And next slide. And we found out that all soy, so we went through all of these papers and we found out that every plant in the universe, every fungi, every bacteria, uses a metabolic pathway called C1 metabolism, okay? Next, and I'll show you what that is. Next. So we, by the way, go back, we went through nearly 683, 6,837 papers across 23 countries. We didn't cherry pick. Next. And what we found was that all plants have an engine. They synthesize the thiamine, there's a methylation cycle. Plants actually create formaldehyde, but they detoxify it using a very important antioxidant some of you may have heard of called glutathione. Everyone heard of that? Yes. So plants have this beautiful cycle. So they create formaldehyde and then they get rid of it. Create formaldehyde, they get rid of it. This is their natural process. Next. So we published that paper and we, and we found out all the pathways. Next. Next, next, and then we publish that in a paper in Agricultural Sciences. Okay, next, next, and then the next thing we did was, and we, by the way, we put through this cytosol. Next, so first is we just published the literature. Next, and then we mathematically modeled it. Next, and we, oh, I'm sorry, go before. So previously, we see as glutathione levels in normal plants maintain a nice steady state. Next. And, and formaldehyde is created and it gets destroyed, okay? This is in normal plants, next. And same here, we tested it on all different cases, next. And that was published in a second paper, next. And then we said, what happens when a plant undergoes oxidative stress, next. And here, we modeled the mechanisms of oxidative stress, next. Connected it together, and you see something fascinating. What is oxidative stress to a plant when it's under stress? Physical stress, drought, pollution, etc. Next. And what happens in that case, next, we connected all those pathways. Plants actually deplete their glutathione levels because they're fighting an oxidative stress. They need an antioxidant. Next. And guess what happens? Formaldehyde will accumulate. But in nature, this doesn't occur all the time. A drought comes and it goes away. A drought comes and it goes away, right? It's, it's not like you, you're constantly under that attack. Next. Next, um, these are different examples of that, formaldehyde accumulation. The final paper we did, or next to final, next, is that, next, by the way, that was published. We said, what happens when genetic modification takes place in the soy plant? I don't know if you know how they make GMO soy. Everyone know the background? So farmers in the Midwest are planting soy without any pesticides at some point. And then Monsanto came in and said, look, you need to use pesticides to increase your yield. So they gave them a pesticide called Roundup, which is also known as glyphosate. So they then started putting that onto their fields, and it was killing off the weeds, um, and they quote unquote got better yield, okay? However, that poison was also starting to kill some of the soy plants. So the yield started going down. So Monsanto said, oh, don't worry, we have a solution. Um, we're gonna modify that plant where we're gonna insert a gene from a bacteria into the soy plant, and then we're gonna create a plant that could withstand our Roundup, okay? So they had the sales of Roundup, but now they, if people were farmers on this side, they also bought the Roundup Ready Seeds, RRS, okay? So these farmers were putting pesticides and they were doing Roundup seeds, and if one of those seeds went and landed on someone's property over here, Monsanto was licensing those seeds, so they would come sue you saying, hey, you owe me money. And they were actually adjudicating that in the courts and winning. So if the plant came here, you had to now start using their seed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Roundup Ready Soy 
um, was that genetic modification. So what we found was when that genetic modification took place, uh, four different chemicals were upregulated. Again, we're going down to the molecular level, right? This, and we found out when we plugged that in, the plant was actually undergoing oxidative stress. Next. Next. And we put it all together into this. You see, we can build pieces. Isn't this cool? From a systems approach, you can start seeing the whole. Next. And next. We put all this together. And what you see here is in the normal plant, non-GMO, formaldehyde is produced and it's destroyed. But look what happens in the GMO plant. It accumulates formaldehyde. Next. This is soy, and that's because glutathione levels are getting depleted, all right? Now, when we published this, a bunch of the academics who support Monsanto got really upset. They said, oh, this is just a computer model. It doesn't mean anything. Next. But we got very lucky. Next. We actually found a group in London, in UK, who had actually grown. By the way, our model predicted for organic soy would have this much level of glutathione and this much level of round, um, I'm sorry, organic soy would have a very high level of glutathione, which is a good antioxidant. The Roundup Ready soy would have nearly 250% less. Next. Guess what we found? This group in London, and in UK, had actually leads, had actually grown soy plants, and they found the same result. Next. So this basically, you went from theory to modeling to actually science. So this was pretty cool. Okay, and by the way, the guy who was attacking us was a guy called Kevin Folta. He started with personal attacks, but this guy didn't invent email. So if you see a lot of stuff, people always say, I, don't, I didn't invent email, okay? Um, but he had said, I have nothing to do with Monsanto. I'm an independent scientist. Well, a FOIA was done on the University of Florida. Uh, 4,000 emails came out. One of the emails was an attachment to Folta where he was getting $25,000 to be their spokesman. Okay, that finally came out of the front page of New York Times. Up until then, the New York Times was also uh, supporting this. Next. Anyway, this was published here. So, so I wanted to give you that to say, so let's just, we're gonna wrap up shortly, but I wanted to take you, so there's a whole different way of looking at the world, which has existed now since 2003, which is a systems approach. We can, in fact, understand systems. We can decentralize it. We can apply to complex problems, and it's not hearsay. We're actually doing it. It's been around, we've been doing this for 16 years. We applied it to a very interesting, controversial problem, okay? And it's published out there. You want to argue with this, there's nothing to argue. Argue with the molecular uh, science of it. And no one wants to go there anymore. That's, um, so, uh, by the way, this was done. You can see, this is what the results of this computation biology. We went through 100, 23 countries, thousands of papers, and we said GMO soy is not equal to organic soy, scientific method. Up until then, it was this consensus, right? That there are safety standards, when in fact there is no safety standards for genetic engineered foods, period. There is none. Next. So, let's go to the immune system. So that was, now you're basically a PhD student now, okay? <laughs> Seriously, I took you through undergraduate, uh, actually elementary school, uh, high school, graduate school, I mean undergraduate, graduate, now you're at the PhD level, okay? So the modern, this is gonna be easy now, okay? So we call it the systems architecture of the immune system. You know what a systems architecture is, right? What does that look like? Next. So first of all, why is the immune system exist, right? First of all, why do systems even exist? Okay, every system, man-made systems or natural systems are designed to be able to be handle a certain amount of stress and bounce back, okay? So stress and bounce back. So if you build a skyscraper today, you don't build it to be rigid, do you? You build it to have a certain amount of sway, otherwise it's gonna crack, right? Um, if you watch, uh, you know, grass, it doesn't, any, anything in nature which stands too stiff, it gets busted, right? It learns how to flex and it learns how to bounce back. So the father of stress was known as Hans Selig. He noticed that um, when he was trying to, it's a weird experiment he was doing, he was taking rats out and he was noticing that when he was trying to inject the rat with something, the other rats in the cage got more stressed out than the rat and they were getting the same ulcer. So he called this stress, uh, but he borrowed it from an engineering term. So stress comes from an engineering term. Next. And in, in engineering, you have two types of stress. You can take something and hit it with, you know, what's called 
Um, tensional compress, compress, compressive, compressional stress or shear stress when you move something like this. But the point is, it's actually a physical phenomenon that comes from engineering. Next. And or you, know, you have this kind of stress, right? And you can actually calculate stress force per unit area. Next. Uh, this curve is showing that, you know, a rubber band, you can pull it and you can pull it, but if you pull it too much, it'll snap, right? But you pull certain things and they have the ability to bounce back, right? And at a certain point, they fracture. So the point is that everything in nature has the ability to be stressed, but the important thing is that you're also supposed to stress things. And we'll get to that next. And that's called the property of resilience, all right? So one of the things that comes, the real strength of any system in nature of man-made is resilience. So when you think about the immune system, it's really its ability to take on something and bounce back. If you lift weights, right? The first time you go to lift weights, maybe you can do 120 pounds on a bench press, right? And you feel achy. And then you come back and your body bounces back. It's, it's, it bounces back better than it was before. You're able to do 130, 150, and then you're doing finally 225. Right, whatever that is. But these are the different definitions of stress. One is the ability to adapt in the face of trauma, adversity, tragedy, or even significant ongoing stressors, right? But it's the ability to recover quickly from illness, change, or misfortune, right? A measure of a body's resistance to deformation. So you take on something and you bounce back. So resilience is the ability of the body to come back, potentially not only to where it was, but even better. Okay? Some people call this stress inoculation. The military does this, uh, we do it in athletics, but we do it even with materials. Next. And one of the key features of a resilient system, it has spare capacity, it's flexible, it's limited uh, or safe failure, which prevents failures from rippling across systems, rapid rebound, the capacity to reestablish function, constant learning, and ability to bounce back, okay? So when we think about health, I would argue that this is how we start defining health of a successful immune system. Next. So a shock absorber does that, right? Next. So we have systems in our body, you know, the lateral meniscus and medial meniscus, we're able to take stresses, right? Nature has developed us so we can handle stress. Otherwise, we would just be brutal things. We take a shock and we just shatter. Next. So we're, uh, next. So one of the interesting things that's happened is, if you look at the HPA axis, right? Your, your body, when it gets a, a stress, actually releases, you know, cortisol. And your body goes for a, from the adrenal all the way from the hypothalamus to the adrenals to the corticosteroids. So your body has this ability, the flight or fight response, to release the corticosteroids. Next. And what people have done is one of the interesting phenomena that comes out of this, is very important to understand this relative to the immune system, is homeostasis and allostasis. Everyone heard of homeostasis, right? Your body is at a certain state, right? You're, you have whatever, 98.2 is it, 98.6? Your body tries to maintain a certain temperature. You, you, you go out in the cold, right? Your body still knows how to maintain that temperature. It's called homeostasis. So your body systems try to maintain their natural state. A plane is flying, the autopilot system is constantly adjusting to try to maintain direction. Allostasis is a very interesting, it's, it's a little bit different, difficult to explain, but let me put it to you this way. Imagine that you have people who are chronically ill, okay? They don't even know what homeostasis is anymore. So they're operating over here when their body should be over here. They've been sick for 20 years of their life, they're in allostasis. They think that is normal. So allostasis is a mode where your body is in a stress situation and it adapts to that stress. Doesn't mean it's good for it, but it's not homeostasis, but it's a dysfunctional state. That's allostasis, all right? Next. So um, Lazare is the one who found that there are chemicals, uh, that there are stress chemicals uh, and even mild dosages can cause alarm and prolong prolonged ex exposure can result in the body adapting. And adap ad adaptation disturbs homeostasis. So you're under constant stress of some kind, immune stress, stress at home, your body will move to a different state and you think it's adapting to it, but it really isn't. It's essentially this allostasis mode. Next. And there have been papers now coming out, you know, in the last 10 years about really understanding the neurobiology of res resilience. Next. 
Uh, I'm not going to go through this chart. Basically, what they found, what the research shows is that the three factors that some, have you noticed some people can handle a lot of stress and they're pretty cool? And other people, a little stress hits them and they freak out. Well, it's, it's not only your genetics, it's your epigenetics, but it's also something called stress inoculation. So this is what is very important to the larger discussion of the immune system. So definitely it's your genetics, definitely it's what you eat, the environmental stuff that turn on and turn off your genes, but there's something even more important, I think it's called stress inoculation, which means if you never exercise your, let's say you have great genetics and you're eating certain food, but you never exercise your body, you never expose it to stress, what's gonna happen? It's gonna atrophy, right? It never gets to turn on certain chemical pathways that it should. Next. So, um, the, the, one of the interesting, there's a neuro, uh, so, uh, uh, I wanna be able to read this here. Um, oh yeah, so adaptogens, okay? Adaptogens, Simulate, stimulate neuropeptide Y. So they've actually identified a chemical which actually is closely correlated to resilience, neuropeptide Y and HSP72. Next. And so what we found is that certain compounds like ginseng, right, ashwagandha, certain herbs, that when you take these, it actually upregulates HPY, which, is, which helps you adapt to stress, which supports survival, longevity, higher cognitive function. So there are certain chemicals which actually can help your body become more resilient. Well, there's also exercises, physical exercise, potentially meditation, potentially certain foods. You follow? So there are things that you can do to your body that actually enable you to upregulate HPY, which supports stress inoculation. Next. And what's really interesting in this curve is this is a normal person. But if you stress inoculate someone, you can create people who get better performance and don't get as stressed as faster. That's what this early blue curve means. The simple thing to take away from this is that stress is not a bad thing, okay? Stress is not a bad thing. So if you think about the public health model, there was a time when people lived in a lot of slums, right? A lot of dirt, a lot of uh, public health issues. And in those conditions, what ended up happening was people were overstressed. Their body never had a chance. You were constantly under stress. So when public health came in the 1900s in this country, we started what? Adding vitamin A. We stopped child labor. We started, um, you know, eliminating filth in the sewage. All those things. But that eliminated a certain amount of stress. It didn't mean it eliminated everything. But that's why you saw the death rates come from 14 out of 100,000 in 1900 down to around one to, um, you know, out of, uh, I think one to 200,000, long before medical interventions like vaccines came, right in the 1950s. But stress inoculation has two sides to it. You don't want to be lifting weights seven days a week, you're going to tear up your muscle tissue, right? You want to do maybe three days rest, but that also varies. If you're someone who's coming out of rehab, you got to take it slowly. Everybody is different. So how you inoculate is important. Next. In Japanese sword making, the way they make the strongest swords, they heat them, right, next, and then they quench them, right? And they do this over hundreds of years. So the strongest things are made through both, next, through, um, and if you do yoga, if you do certain types of yoga, you will do standing poses, next, and then you will do shavasana, okay? The aspect of going from stress to rest, stress to rest, is what your body wants, and that's how you create stress inoculation and you get stronger. So what I'm saying is when we talk about the immune system, we need to take a step back and discuss, it's not about never exposing your immune system to anything, or always exposing it, it's a, a model of where you need to find how you become resilient. And that path is a very personal path. The res how someone who's just been in a, uh, let's say, had all sorts of autoimmune issues, all sorts of genetics, how they achieve resilience is very different than someone, let's say, who grew up around dirt all the time, you know, in a farm environment, exposed to a lot of things. They probably have a much more resilient system, and they can probably achieve a higher level of resilience. You follow what I'm saying? So the goal here is resilience, and the path to resilience varies from individual to individual. Next. So that's, so I want you to really take this away. You have, for, if the individual's here, oops, I'm sorry, my thing is working on previous. 
Previous, previous slide. Yeah, previous slide. Previous slide. So if you're here and you want to really build a resilient body, it's genetics, it's epigenetics, but it's also how you modulate stress to your body. Next. And so this is why where the world is today, people are recognizing, even in Western traditional medicine, you have to move to a personalized and precision medicine. Okay? They may not have articulated this, but the goal is if you want to build a resilient, healthy immune system, it's personalized and it has to be precise. It's not one size fits all. Next. And this goes back to 5,000 years ago, the right medicine for the right person at the right time. Next. Now, to, to, to talk about vaccines and to talk about the immune system, in China, when people had, they, they did a process called variolation, right? They would actually take smallpox or the pus of something and shoot it into someone's nose. So it was the actual, the actual disease that you were getting, right? It wasn't a variation of it, it wasn't a simulation. Next, it gets even more interesting. In Africa, they did a technique called variolation where they would, if someone in one neighboring village was getting a disease, they would take some of that disease item, the pus, make a small scar and put that in there. But again, they were giving the entire thing. You follow what I'm saying? It's not a simulation. Next. And in fact, an African slave is the one who brought this technique to the United States when Washington was inoculating people. Inoculation at that point, variolation was very different than the injection of a vaccine. It was giving the whole substance. And that technique was brought by the slave who taught it here, and then it was used to, you know, uh, hit about 40,000 soldiers, and a lot of them got protected by this process. But it wasn't the vaccine process of things mixed in together. You understand, it was a whole thing. Next. Uh, next. So, and then, you know, Edward Jenner took this on, and then this technique, in, next, became uh, more what we today call the modern vaccine, which is a very different, uh, uh, thing that's done today, which is not the entire uh, stuff coming through your innate and your adaptive system. So what I want to finish up with is the immune system. The immune system that we use today to build immunity, which is primarily through vaccination, is created from a model uh, of understanding the innate and the adaptive system, okay? And this is, goes back to 1915, and it also goes back to 1954. And the adapt, so there's two boxes that they have, the innate and the adaptive. Every, how many people are familiar with this? Okay, so okay, about a quarter. So we'll go through this. So if I, I always use this example of Richard. If I sneeze on Richard right now, okay, and I'm carrying some, uh, I have a flu, right, and I sneeze on him, how does he, how does his body react to that? Well, let's follow that through. The particles of sneeze <laughs> hit his face, okay, hit his eyes, hit his skin, go up through his nose, maybe go through his ears. That's called the innate immune system, okay? Everything that is open to the environment. It may even, maybe he may gets in his mouth, it goes into his gut, whatever, right? So the innate immune system is the system that your, your body first comes into contact with what you call the pathogen. And when your body comes into contact with that, Richard's immune system reacts back with an artillery of just firing everywhere. I gotta kill, these are these stuff that she just dumped on me. So a bunch of soldiers that come out and just start shooting everywhere. That's called the innate system. That's why it's called the first line of defense, and it's non-specific. And that system typically takes the first zero to 72 hours, okay? So that's when you may get a fever, you may get chills, right? Um, in fact, this is a good time. I noticed that if you catch this earlier on, you can knock out a cold very quickly if you watch this stuff coming, you can support that process. If you go beyond this, then your adaptive immune system kicks in. That adaptive system says, oh, he's got this particular virus, then Richard's adaptive immune system, he brings out the Navy SEALs, and the Navy SEALs say, I gotta knock out that particular virus, XYZ, and I'm gonna create an antibody to go take out XYZ, you follow? And that immune system, the adaptive, it remembers XYZ. So if I sneeze on it again, X, Y, Z hits, he's fine. Got it? Simple, right? Next slide. So again, to review, the immune system has the innate immune system composed of the skin, you know, your gut, all this stuff that is open to the atmosphere. 
at these cells to get a little more detail. Monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils. These are those different infantry people, right? They go and try to uh, destroy that pathogen. If it makes it past this, it goes to your Navy SEALs, which con consists of two groups, T cells and B cells, okay? These are the things that are known to have memory. Next. And by the way, this is another way of looking at it, just very simply, these are the different features. The innate immune system is immediate versus this taking three days to kick in. This is on or off. This has various degradation, degradation you know, gradations. This is lower or higher. This is fast. This is slow. This amplification is, there's nothing. This amplifies itself. This is short. This is long. Once he remembers that virus, it stays on. It has memory. This um, is always present. This is normally silent. It's just sitting there. And then the Navy SEALs come out of their bunkers, right? This is unspecific. This is highly specific. Next. Now, the next couple of diagrams, you may want to take notes because if you want to explain this, this system that I'm talking about, this two-body system, in some ways I call it the, I don't want to use flat earth because that, the whole flat earth stuff's going on out there, but uh, if, you, if you want to use that, let's assume this is sort of the one-dimensional view of the immune system. You have the innate immune system and you have the adaptive. Pathogen hits in, we talked about this. And then, at some time later, the adaptive immune system gets in, and you look at antibodies. So, this two-box model goes back to 1915, on a bad day, on a good day to 1950s, 50s, okay? This is the model that still, that MDs learn, that pediatricians learn, that this is what people learn as the immune system. You guys got it? The innate and the adaptive. So, Next, and when you give a vaccine, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not gonna get it through, if you saw that, remember the, the guy, with, the Chinese guy shooting it up through the guy's nose, okay? I'm not gonna even go through the innate system. I'm gonna bypass that. I'm gonna go into your bloodstream um, and I'm gonna go give you a vaccine, which by the way, is not that whole pathogen. We're trying to simulate nature. It could be an attenuated virus, right? It could be a live virus. You add other stuff to it. Um, there's something called an adjuvant. Everyone heard that term? An adjuvant is like an Uber driver, right? It's a taxi driver. He makes it easy for that for you to be delivered. So in this case, the the attenuated virus can be delivered in a faster way. But what you see here is the measure of success is called the antibody. Okay? What did we just talk about 10 minutes ago? Of the immune system. One of the real measures of success is resilience, right? That's like a much more different, it's a systems concept. This is a reductionist concept. We talked about that, right? In some ways, this is a blind man's concept of trying to find one variable to hold on to. But that's what goes on today. So this two box model is a 1915, 1950s model of the immune system. Got it? Yes? Yes. Okay, next. Well, for my PhD work, remember I said I had to do something beyond just creating some technology? I actually had to model something new. And one of the systems I took on was the interferon system. Guess what the interferon system is? It's a missing link between the innate and the adaptive. There is actually something that connects this to this. And this was also discovered during the 50s. And a lot of work was done by the Japanese who actually understood all those little chemical pathways. And I actually worked on this. And the interferon system is fascinating because what it shows is that when you get hit with one virus, guess what? The body actually gets ready not only against that virus, but many other viruses. So let me repeat that. Experiments that they did initially with rabbits said when that rabbit got exposed to one virus, when another virus was introduced, that rabbit was actually able to fight a completely different virus. You guys see what I'm saying? How was it able to do that? Isaacs and Lindemann found out there were things called interferons, things that interfere. So what that means is when things come through your adaptive and, and, and go through this process, it's not only adaptive immune system has its infantry, but there's another system here called the interferon system. And the interferon system is actually bringing out other chemicals which are able to interfere against other viruses. And this system actually has memory. The old model was, oh, there's no memory here, only this has memory. It's actually not true. There's actually memory here and here. The latest work says thousands of genes get generated between here and here, and your system has transcriptional memory. 
So the whole notion of, oh, this has memory, this doesn't, it's actually, that's 1950 to 100 years old. Next. So, next. So, um, Richard, how are we doing on time? Uh, 8.34. Okay. I think we have to be out of here at 9, right? So I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes so we can have some questions. Is that, is Stuart here still? Right. Stuart, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so next. Next. So let me just, the quick notion of the interference is next. This is go through, stop right here. Next slide. So next. Right. So there are different kinds of, you don't need to, you're not going to get quizzed on this, but there are early stage interference called alpha and beta. When things come through the innate immune system, the alpha and beta gets turned on first, and then the gamma and the lambda get turned on in the adaptive. But these things are extremely important because they control innate and the adaptive systems. Next. And for my PhD work, what I did was I actually looked at the complexity of the interferon system, where it begins with, so this outer circle here represents a cell wall. This represents a nuclear wall. It looks really complicated, but I simply put there are four phases of the inter interferon system. A virus hits, and your body creates interferon beta. Your, so that means your body wants a virus, okay? A virus comes and your body creates interferon beta because your body has interferon regulatory factors. The interferon beta goes to a neighboring cell and it tells that cell, hey, a virus has been created and that neighboring cell creates IRF7. When a virus lands, your body then creates like a nuclear reaction of interferon alpha and beta. Simply put, your body is waiting for a virus and then through another process, Interferons are created to interfere with that virus. Okay? Next. Next. So what I did in, in the interest of time is I looked at all these molecular mechanisms. Next. Next. Very much like the GMO example, we literally modeled the effort of interferon um, gamma coming up, which literally, uh, I'm sorry, beta comes up, which comes up within the first 8.3 hours, and this comes up around 12 hours later. Next. And then we matched it with clinical data. The point being, the interferon system today is very well understood, but I don't think most of the traditional medical system teaches this, okay? But you've learned it. Next. But in closing, um, next slide, this was a very important paper, pre previous slide, that just came out in 2017. It's a great paper. It says we need to take immunology to a systems approach. It's the first paper of its kind. Um, it says systems immunology, just getting started. You can get it on PubMed. Next. And what the paper ends with is saying, look, the immune system affects so many subsystems. The immune system is sort of like the operating system of the whole body. It's quite amazing. Next. And what you find here is that the, this was, by the way, I think done by Howard Hughes Medical, uh, you know, uh, Institute, the Institute. And it says, a case in point is that the main immunological metrics used widely in medicine are white blood cell counts and complete blood cell counts. The former was developed in 1915 and the latter was developed in 1959. It's time for an upgrade, okay? So this is the uh, previous slide. So you'll see the previous slide. So you can get this paper, but this is coming out of Stanford. It's coming out of, you know, very uh, elite established institutions. Next. But so when you look at this, uh, next. So when I, next, so the, the upgrade, if you look at here, pathogen comes in, the IFN system, but the adaptive system also, if you notice here, shuts off the innate. Because if you didn't have this feedback turning things off, guess what you'd have? You'd have autoimmune, right? Things are constantly being produced. So you have to have pathogen comes in and you turn things off. Next. And so if you look at the real architecture of the immune system, this is, in my view, what I shared at the NSF is a much more closer view in 2019. And you're welcome to take pictures of it if you want. Uh, it's the DNA, interacting with the IFN, interacting with the adaptive. And guess what? We now know the microbiome, right? We have 10 trillion or 100 trillion bacteria. We probably have 300 trillion viruses within us. All these things are in our gut. They're everywhere. We're not just ourselves. We're a whole other organism. And this system directly interacts with the neural system. It's called the gut-brain axis. But the interferon system, and you notice there's feedback, this is a much more modern view of the immune system. Next. And so what I want to probe as a scientific question is, 
This was the way we were supposed to get quote unquote immunized. A pathogen came in, it turned this on, then it turned this on, it turned this on, it interacted with the microbiome, interacted with the neural system. You notice what I'm saying here? It's a much more of the ankle bones connected to the foot bone, et cetera. And when it came through this example, your body knew how to adjust, it adjusted itself very much like the difference between the organic and the soy plant, right? It goes into a different homeostasis or out, it goes into a new homeostasis. The thesis that we're finding is this is where you build resilience when it goes through this path. Next. The question is, what happens when you get a vaccine? Because the vaccine is hitting the adaptive immune system. So if you go play with this, could you not argue that other systems would want to try to balance that? Okay? By, because they haven't seen this before. It didn't come through the normal channel. So when it comes through this way, how do these systems interact? Would they respond in autoimmunity failures, right? Would the body go into chronic inflammation? Right? Would the microbiome change here to adjust? And these are personalized questions of medicine. Some people may not be affected. Other people may, to varying degrees. Next. So I think the research question that's out there is, I can go this way or I can go this way. Okay? So the question is, you get an immune response here, you get an immune response here. What are the risks of this? What are the benefits? What are the risks of this? And what are the benefits? So the reason I want to share that with you, this is really the framing of the question. Next. And so, next. So some interesting questions come out, and I'll close with this. So what is the role of vaccination in the context of personalized medicine? You know, how many vaccines do you give person A? You know, how many vaccines do you not give person A, right? What's right for one person may not be right for the other person. How well are we really addressing the health of the public with one size fits all approach that doesn't acknowledge a complex system, right? It's a research question. By the way, anyone want to do PhDs on this, you can. Uh, what is the proper role of information theory, you know, in terms of personalized health? Next. And what should the locus, of, I, to me, this is a very interesting question. What should the locus of control of healthcare be? Decentralized or centralized? You know, in traditional systems, of medicine, you always have a local doctor. When I grew up in the 70s, I had a relationship with my local doctor. I understood him, he knew my family, etc. right? The health emerged from that narrative that took place, that relationship. Or should it be imposed from top down? One size fits all. Again, this is a very interesting, it's not a, in my view, this is actually an engineering question. It's a scientific question. Where does healthcare, where should it be? Decentralized or centralized? I would argue, this model can be very expensive. This model may not be as expensive, just from an economic standpoint, okay? Next. Next, and the final set of questions are, can healthcare be fully predicted when we're dealing with biological systems that are infinitely complex, not like physics, or should we not um, aim for resilience in health, come what stress or may, right? That's really the question. How, how do you look at this problem? And then finally, where, when we go from a paradigm of win-lose dynamics research to a paradigm like cytosol, inclusive, systems biology, what, what changes? And then finally, next, is do vaccines bypass short circuit the time pen system? Richard, what time is it? Okay, so we should, we have to get out of here, right, Stuart, by nine? Correct. We have to be out. So I will take maybe like three questions so we can leave here in a good manner. We can meet outside if you want. Any questions? Yep. Uh, so what we do with cytosol, we've looked at inflammation. So the interesting thing is I'm more interested in neural inflammation because uh, when people talk about things like autism, if you actually look at it, the word has become so such a big spectrum. But one thing is clear, there's neural inflammation taking place. So one of the things we are doing is looking at how different constitutive materials are starting to look at this. We actually held a science, you know, when I got into this, I wanted to take a very scientific approach. We actually called a, a scientific conference. We had a working group. We've been very busy, but we're getting data together to actually start building a systems model of understandings. But that's one of the things we want to do. Yes. Yep. Metabolic what? Congestion. Yeah. So basically, if you had a certain level of stress on the mitochondria, you would slowly, algorithmically limit the amount, the, the appropriate um, proteins, and therefore develop various diseases according to you know what your what your stress level could handle. So that, so that was the reason why certain people did fine through the not uh, you know the plague of, of 1918 and others did not. But his theory was 
So what's your question? Have you considered his work? And, why, and I never hear that work. And, and I was always taught that. I mean, I was always just shown the mitochondria matters at that level. The algorithmic problems there are what they hear. So, so let me let me just, so I was in Israel for about uh, seven days. One of the leading guys on mitochondrial understanding is a guy called Abram Mayevsky. The thing with the mitochondrial areas is um, what Abram did was he figured out a way to measure mitochondria in vivo, in the map, in real time. So when you look at the mitochondrial research, there is one body of research which is all in a, in a test tube. You see? So it's a very, um, it's a very good, it's an amazing area for research because my, mitochondrial function, to your point, uh, is an amazing way to diagnose sort of uh, what's going on throughout the body. And so, um, when I was in Israel, Abram had, had built some amazing machines, very amazing technology, which actually lets you measure mitochondrial function in real time. I mean, in your body in real time. So that's one of the technologies that should be brought and understood. You know, it, it's going to be an important technology to get get a handle on this. But was it predictive at all? It's not only it's better than predictive. You can actually measure in you your mitochondrial function. So, so the thing is, there's the body of literature, most of the literature that's done today is in, in, in vitro, right? Very little of it is done in the whole human. So, it, but yeah, I mean, there's huge connections between mitochondrial function and disease. I just wonder if your work. Uh, we do stuff with the mitochondria, but I think one of the areas is to get better measurements. Yep. We'll take one more. Yes. Have you looked at all into the effect of GMOs on the microbiome? Yeah, so the question is, have you looked at the effect of GMOs on the microbiome? So the research I shared with you there, when we looked at C1 metabolism, that pathway exists in plants, in fungi, and bacteria. So the C1 metabolism pathway actually exists in bacteria. So those findings, if you want to look at it, 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 genetic engineering, People have found double-stranded RNA actually jumps, and people have found it in the gut. That Look, one of the important things, I'll end with this, is there's always a theory stuff is coming from outside in. There's this other theory of the viral theory, that we, we carry trillions of viruses within us, and these things are constantly mutating. Here's an interesting thing, and I'll leave this with you. Um, and people are starting to talk about this. It's not my idea is that, is it possible if you took a human being and you put him in a room by himself and he wasn't exposed to any other humans, that measles would come out of him? Or, because mutations are taking place. It's not always from outside in. Is our body itself creating viruses in real time? Testing itself. Why would we have so many pathogens? Why would we have so many different viruses? But in closing, what I want you to consider, I think the main takeaway, if you could go back to the previous slide, previous, previous, previous to that, previous, keep going back, keep going back, is really this, okay? The main thing is, we set a two box model, we have a much more complex model, and things could even be more complex. Um, when you start intervening, whether it be GMOs, where you're inserting a gene from over here to over here, I'm not saying that we should stop science, okay? What I am saying is that when you do that kind of intervention into a very, very complicated engineering system, look, I build software, I build products, okay? If you have a very complex airplane, and you go make one little, each, uh, how many people do software engineering here? Anyone build software? Okay, you do. What's the worst thing you want to hear someone say? Oh, I just made that one little change, right? That's like, that's like so scary to me. We'd have engineers right before the product goes, oh, I just made one little change. Well, that one little change, when it's not tested, could cause the whole thing to break. Am I right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So when you make one little change, go ahead, go do that. I'm not saying, but no, have a humility to know that one little change can have systemic effects everywhere else. And that's what really, and engineers do this. The problem with it, here's the difference between engineering and science. In engineering, we actually, when we build something, I build this thing, I actually know all the parts. I know that if I do this, it can have this effect over here. The problem with the body is we don't actually know all the components yet. We're actually reverse engineering it. 
And it's, it's a much more, it should be a much more humbling activity. So when we do interventions, we should know that it could have perturbations elsewhere. So if we're going to do that, we should have that humility to understand that, or at least be ready to do the science and have more and more discourse in science. And that's why I wanted to end with those research questions. There's some awesome research questions uh, to probe, and I think we're at a very important golden age in science if we're willing to start looking at this and embrace it. Thank you.